became a reality with a great big new building at 812 North Queen Street, and it has now grown to become a hub of activity and a place of compassionate and caring service. Then in 2019, in order to better communicate to our neighbors that we were here for them, right? You, you can connect with food as compared to what does the Council of Churches do. Our name was changed, but we remain committed to all three programs, food, clothing, and shelter. So we serve as the county's largest free food distribution site um, for the over 52,000 individuals in our county who might suffer from food insecurity. We provide food directly to clients who come pick it up, to agency caseworkers who pick up and deliver to their clients, and to some um, uh, low-income, low high-rise housing. We do some deliveries. And we touch through those programs about 30 to 35,000 people a year. Um, I'm pretty sure you're familiar with community meals, but um, in Lancaster County, seven days a week, three meals a day, as long as you can get to them, you can find a free meal. Um, we provide a great deal of the food for a number of the organizations and churches who do those free meals, and they're touching almost 70,000 people a year. So 100,000 times we're touching people with food each year. The clothing bank, <clears throat> we think, we don't have statistics, but we think it's the largest one in the county that's completely free. Um, we provide shoes and clothing and socks and underwear for people of all ages and sizes and serve somewhere about around 11,000 people a year. Now for many, many years we've had winter shelter. Uh, many years ago it was for men and boys and then for mothers with children and then just for women. And it's been a consistent place of respite. But in the last five years or so, it's transitioned to be more than just a place to lay, lay your head at night. We've employed a bridge out of poverty type outreach approach and build relationships and trust with the women who, with the women who were coming to us. And about 90% of them every year helped themselves move into more stable circumstances. But almost 500 people are unsheltered each night in Lancaster County. And last year, over 7,000 people had to access homelessness services for one reason or another. Across the United States, we have not seen, seen homelessness at this level since the Great Depression. And Lancaster County is not immune to that. So last summer, in response to Community Imperative and in partnership with the Lancaster County Homelessness Coalition, we were awarded a grant to expand our emergency shelter and now we provide overnight shelter 365 nights a year for adult men and women. And so that we can continue to provide that supportive outreach approach, relationship building approach. In the daytime, we have a shelter that provides outreach social services. We connect our neighbor, homeless neighbors with not just referrals to agencies that can assist them, but with one-on-one -on -one encouragement every day a little bit like family tough love, so that they can begin to believe that there's hope and that there can be change in their lives, and that they can create a pathway to more stable life circumstances. We don't do it for them, but we try to walk with them. So in our very first year, so August was the anniversary, one year of 365 nights of shelter, we think that we've touched about half of those 500 people who sleep outside at night. And of those, about 50% of them are living now within more stable circumstances. The pandemic wreaked havoc on our knowledge, our data acquisition, and our understanding of our vulnerable neighbors. Needs for services would rise and then fall, and we would have leftover food and things as subsidies were added or canceled. And, and planning how to meet neighbors' needs was, was truly a guessing game. But now, the poverty gap, the homelessness gap is, well, it's gaping, and demand for services that we provide is rising to the highest levels ever. Food and housing are scarce, and shelters like ours are full with waiting lists. We're pulling tricks from our sleeves every day to meet the needs, and for one of the few times in our history, we're having to make commercial food purchases to keep enough food on our shelves to make sure that we can keep our orders full for our clients. It is only through the support 
of the Food Hub family, congregations like yours, that we can meet the demand. You've long been a key part of our foundation. You're the foundation on which we were built, and we're deeply grateful for your support. Thanks so much. Thank you, Paige. What a blessing you are. Thank you for all you do. Yesterday, we were privileged to uh, honor Doc Harriger's homegoing. And um, I liked what was printed on the front of his bulletin, and it's so Doc Harriger. My father's house has room to spare. And I'm sure that was a message that he shared with all of us and wanted to share with everyone he met, that there's room in God's house for you. And on the back it said, and now these three remain, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. And Doc was a wonderful example of love. And I'm so glad that um, they joined the Seeker Sunday School class and we had the opportunity to even have Doc teach us sometimes. He had a very simple message. He said, it's simple, and keep it simple. Love God, love others. Start your day with gratitude and end it with gratitude. A great lesson. He reminded us often, and truthfully, we needed to be reminded often. And I, when I think of him, I will think of those things, and I look forward to seeing him once again in heaven. And one of the, the wonderful things that I enjoyed of the service yesterday was that after Pastor Doug got done praying and said amen, everybody joined in with a hearty amen. And I know that's part of some faith traditions, not the brethren, where we're very quiet. But that meant so much to me, just to hear everybody confirm with all men what, doctor, what uh, Pastor Doug said. So if you don't mind, if you would indulge me today, after I'm done with my morning prayer, and as I say all men, would you please join me with a hearty all men? Amen, amen, whichever one you want to say. I don't even know what will come out of my mouth. It's different every time. So with that, would you join me in our opening prayer? Lord, we are here. We have come this morning. We are here to worship. Some of us have come weary. We've had a tough week, and we know there's a tough week ahead. And in that, Lord, you say, come to me, all you who are weary, and I will give you rest. And we come trusting for that. Some of us come grieving because we've lost loved ones, we've lost jobs, we've lost something that was dear to us. But we know that we mourn. Even though we mourn, we mourn as those with hope because we know that this is just a temporary home. These are just temporary things that happen. We have eternal life with you. Some of us come rejoicing. We've had a fantastic week. And we are ready to shout to the Lord with all the earth and break out in praise and sing for joy. All of us come with different needs, but we all come knowing that we need you, God. We can't do life without you. And we all need to heed your word, to be still and know that I am God. So Lord, in the next few moments, we are just gonna be still we're gonna take a few deep breaths and we're gonna focus on you and prepare our hearts for worship. We thank you for your love. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Would you join me in the call to worship? If you can, please stand. Our call to worship is from Psalms 46, 9. It is he who makes war to cease in all the world. Be still then and know that I am God. I will be exalted upon the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. 
The Lord of hosts is with us. Let's raise our voices in praise to God.
And Lord, we ask that you be with them as they go and learn. Let them be sponges and let them learn and teach us. For we know as children, they have much to teach us because they're close to you. I'm so glad that Laura chose the message for our first scripture. Um, do any of you or did any of you use Excel spreadsheets where you worked? Anybody? You know what they are. I love if then. Do you remember doing formulas if? This is what you input, then this is what should come out. So you could do these great formulas. You would just say, if I do this, then do all these calculations, all these fancy things, and put that down in the rest of the spreadsheet. It was great. Well, I realized that growing up, we learned if-then statements pretty early in life. If you disobey your parents, then there are consequences. And usually they're not pleasant. If you pull the cat's tail, then you either get bit or scratched, and as the cat lever, frankly, you deserved it. <laughs> and if your little brother hit you, and you hit him back, then you got in trouble because he tattled on mom, and you, even though you said, but he hit me first, it was always, well, you're older, and you know better, and you don't hit your little brother. And of course, then you learned life isn't fair. But the most important if-then statement that I hope we've all learned comes from the Bible, and that is, if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, then you will be saved. And Paul expands on that. Um, he is now talking to people who have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ and are saved. And so in Philippians 2, 1 to 11, he talks about if you do this, if this has happened, then this should be what goes on in your life. So listen for the if then. If you've gotten anything at all out of following Christ, if his love has made any difference in your life, if being in a community of the Spirit means anything to you, if you have a heart, if you care, then do me a favor. Agree with each other. Love each other. Be deep-spirited friends. Don't push your way to the front. Don't sweet-talk your way to the top. Put yourself aside and help others get ahead. Don't be obsessed with getting your own advantage. Forget yourselves long enough to lend a helping hand. Think of yourselves the way Christ Jesus thought of himself. He had equal status with God, but didn't think so much of himself that he had to cling to the advantages of that status no matter what. Not at all. When the time came, he set aside the privileges of deity and took on the status of a slave. He became human. Having become human, he stayed human. It was an incredibly humbling process. He didn't claim special privileges. Instead, he lived a selfless, obedient life. And then he died a selfless, obedient death and it was the worst kind of death at that, a crucifixion. Because of that obedience, God lifted him high and honored him far above anyone or anything ever, so that all created beings in heaven and on earth, even those long ago dead and buried, will bow down and worship before this Jesus Christ and call out in praise that he is the master of all to the glorious honor and of God the Father. Will you pray with me, please? Heavenly Father, you are an awesome God. You are the one who created all things, and yet you wanted a relationship with us. Even in our sin, Lord, you came, and you loved us so much that you were willing to give up heaven 
so that we could go there and be with you. Lord, we are so small we can't even comprehend sometimes. We look up at the sky, we look at the stars, we see the vastness, and you created it all, Lord. Lord, we acknowledge that we have come to you in our brokenness. We have come today, we've, most of us have left very comfortable homes. We had comfortable rides here. We've come to a beautiful, comfortable sanctuary to worship you. And remember those in Florida who have lost their homes, their cars, everything, and some of them have lost their sanctuaries to worship you. Lord, we pray for them. We ask that you help them in their recovery. We ask that you give them hope. Lord, we come knowing and believing that we will be safe to be here to worship you. And yet many of our brothers and sisters worldwide risk everything to name the name of Christ, Lord. Many of them have died and many of them will die because they believe in you. Give them courage, give them strength, Help them as they face many dangers just because they love you and they want to worship you. Lord, we think of those in our congregation who have been struggling with health issues. We pray that you will continue to guide in their healing process. We thank you for the word from Dell that he is recovering that if all goes well this week, he will be back in worship with us next Sunday. We thank you for all that you've done in his life and we pray that it will go well and that he will be back here. Lord, we pray for the Hanger family as they mourn the loss of Doc. We thank you that the peace that passes all understanding is with them. Lord, we, um, we will miss Doc but we know we will see him again. Lord, we ask that you be with Laura as she speaks your word to us. We thank you for her answering your call, even though it was difficult. We thank you that she's been studying diligently, that she's going to class, that she's learning many things, and then she comes here and shares with us. We ask that you give her your words to us today, we ask that we listen and hear, not just with our ears, Lord, but with our hearts. We know that we need to be changed, Lord, and we ask that through being here today, we are changed, and that we go through next week as different people. We ask that we can shine as stars, Lord, in this world that is so broken and needs to see you and we can be your hands and feet, Lord. We ask that the Holy Spirit will guide us and lead us as we walk through our days and that we will speak your truth in love to people that we encounter, Lord. And Lord, now we join our voices to speak the words that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day the debt, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now we're going to watch a video, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face. Glory and grace to Jesus, I 
surrender all to him i freely give i will ever love and trust him in his presence daily Our second scripture today comes from Philippians 2, 12 to 18. And I found verse 14 to be one of the most challenging scriptures in my life. Verse 14 says, do everything without complaining or arguing. <laughs> I don't know about you, but complaining comes very naturally for me. And I thought, maybe we need to challenge ourselves. So for the rest of the day, let's see if we can do everything without complaining or arguing. I thought it might be fun for parents if you challenge your children. Um, complaining, I don't want to go to bed, right? Complain, I don't want to do the dishes. I don't want to set the table. Maybe charge them a quarter every time you catch them complaining. And if they hear you complain, they get to get a quarter might be just something fun. But anyhow, I thought maybe if we could get through today without complaining or arguing, maybe we can try it tomorrow too. And maybe for the rest of the week. I think that's a stretch. But anyhow, I want to try it for today to see if I can actually do everything, everything, without complaining or arguing. Um, and it's another if then. If you do everything without complaining, then you will shine like stars. And I had to think about that. What a difference this world would be if just us Christians did everything without complaining and arguing. Would we shine like stars? Would people see a difference? Would they say, hey, there's something different about you? Something God's been teaching me and the Holy Spirit has been leading me is now that I'm retired, I'm not quite as rushed going to the store. Um, so I've tried to get to know my store clerks at the grocery store and at CVS. And it was interesting this week, I haven't seen the one clerk that checks me out sometimes for a few months. And she is normally fairly bubbly and has a smile on her face. She didn't this week. She had a frown and I thought, ooh, she doesn't look like she's having a good day. So when I got up to her, I said, hey, your daughter's birthday's this month, isn't it? She looked at me and she goes, you remembered. And she got this bright smile on her face and it just changed her whole countenance. That one simple statement. Just that I happened to remember that she had told me months ago, and it was really months ago, that her daughter's birthday was in October and 
they were doing a Spider-Man party because that's what she wanted. So just simple things like that, and I challenge you, I know we're all into the self-checkout, and frankly, it is a lot easier and faster. <laughs> sometimes, <laughs> and sometimes it's not. Um, but you know, if you have the time, go through the checkout, meet your clerks. I, I, there's another clerk at Weiss, I, this is the Holy Spirit. She asked me about something I was, had bought, and, I, and she said, well, my husband's diabetic, and yeah, that would be good for him. And, and then we started talking, and she said, my husband needs to get a job, and it's really hard for him being diabetic. And I said, well, I'll pray, it just came out, I'll pray for you. And she looked at me, and she said, well, thank you. And she said, I used to go to church, but then I got divorced, and then I wasn't welcome. So, you know, I, and, and I see her periodically, and I've been praying for her mom, and, you know, I just try to bring that little bit of light into somebody's life, and I think that's what we are called to do, shine your light. So I hope that you, as you go through your week, that as the Holy Spirit prompts you, and you have opportunity, shine your light. And let's talk about and share with each other how we were stars. It's not us. It's, it's the Holy Spirit leading us and God in us. But that's what we're called to do. So Philippians 2, 12 to 18. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. Do everything without complaining or arguing, so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault in a crooked and depraved generation in which you shine like stars in the universe as you hold out the word of life in order that I may boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labor for nothing. But even if I am poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. So you too should be glad and rejoice with me. Laura, we look forward to you bringing his word. Yesterday I had a preaching class and I learned that I don't deliver my sermons the correct way, so probably should have done that before I was five years in. <laughs> um, apparently you're not supposed to write it. Who knew? Um, I'm a writer first, sorry. But also, um, my instructor put to a point something that I have found challenging. When we preach on epistles, it's hard because it was a letter with instructions written to specific people. There's no narrative. Paul said it pretty well. I don't know what I have to add, but it was helpful to hear someone else say, I struggle with that. So it's always nice to know you're not alone. Well, the other day, as I was preparing for my sermon, I did a little bit of crowdsourcing on my Facebook page, as I sometimes do. And so I invite you to take a moment just to reflect on the questions that I posed. These, this is what I asked. When was a time you experienced true joy? When have you rejoiced over a situation or happening? When have others rejoiced with you or you with others? Now, apparently not many people wanted to be involved in a sermon illustration, but a couple brave souls said some things. So I'm going to share what they, what they said. All names to protect the innocent. Somebody said, the birth of our children and our grandchildren, joy for safe deliveries, healthy moms and babies, and for nurturing families that will love those babies. Babies are such a joy. I love when Jesus is glorified in a situation and when I see a young person making a commitment to follow him or hear a story where people acknowledge God's help in their lives, I find deep joy welling up in my soul. Moments where I feel God speaking uniquely to me, feeling God's presence. Times where I'm serving God with my gifts and others doing the same. Choir this past Wednesday. Now, I did not make this up or force anybody. But we did have a pretty good choir rehearsal on Wednesday. God was present. Being part of a group of individuals, all praising God at the same time. Seeing and hearing our children grow in the love and knowledge of God. 
all of the big and small moments in the, when you're surrounded by people and friends, baptism, concerts, sporting events, marriage, birth, even the joy that comes from God and loved one during home goings when we're in our cloud of witnesses. I experienced joy this morning just now after a week of a stressful hospital stay with my daughter. This is not me, this is a friend. I was able to sit on my back deck and enjoy a cup of coffee, looking back at all that happened this past week and realizing how God was with us the whole time filled my heart with gratitude and joy. For myself, I think of family gatherings at my grandparents' farm with delicious food and cherished family yarns being told. I think of the joy that comes when a child suddenly puts together one of those tricky theological concepts that we're trying to break down for them upstairs and you see it connect and the joy fills their face, that's an exciting moment. And I think of the delight I feel when you go, when I'm on a walk and I look up in God's creation and I see a beautiful bird or a butterfly, something that's different than the norm in a place I didn't expect. And this morning, I don't know if you could hear it, we had three young ladies sitting up here praising Jesus with their whole hearts. That was joyful, and it gave me joy. Joy is not really a feeling, though. It's not like happiness that comes and goes. It's more of a heart attitude, and it wells up unexpectedly, but it's kind of been there all along if you're a follower of Christ. It's an attitude that Paul was familiar with, and he wrote a lot about it. And even as he instructed his cherished friends. So you'll remember Paul is in prison. He's chained to a guard and is writing to his friends that need some instruction. And I don't know about you, but I don't think I would be joyful. I just don't. But we see that rather than feeling sorry for himself, Paul uses the situation as a teachable moment. And so in chapter one, you remember that Paul not only instructs his joy and gratitude, or expressed, excuse me, his joy and gratitude for his friends, but he also instructed them on how to deal with the external things that were going on around them. But now Paul shifts his focus inward. And I don't have to tell you that following Christ will produce good fruit in our lives. But I love the way the message translation, which Jamie read for us, frames this. Here's some important questions to consider. Have you gotten anything at all out of following Christ? Has his love made a difference in your life? Does does being in a community of the Spirit mean anything to you? Do you have a heart? Do you care? What's the answer, friends? It's yes, of course. I don't think there's a one of us who would answer no to that. But I love what Paul does next. He says, so if Jesus has done this for you, I want you to do something that will bring me joy. Live in unity. Don't be proud. Don't think of yourself more highly than you ought. Live in humility with others. Humility. I want to give you a quick thought on that. We kind of talked about this in ladies' Bible study because part of our scripture passage that went along with our book was chapter 2 in Philippians. We love when God lines everything up. But this is something Paul is suggesting is important, and he's going to continue to give us a pretty good example of humility. But also, it's something for us to practice as well. And in our culture, and in the Greek culture of the day, humility was, is not considered something good. We think of humility as weak or less than, mousy or something like that. And I think of the original lyrics of a beloved hymn, Alas, and did my Savior bleed, and did my Sovereign die? Would he devote his sacred head for such a worm as I? Mm. That's what the world thinks humility looks like. What is true, however, is that humility involves confidence in and obedience to God. Humility says I can serve God and others confidently because I'm secure in my identity in Christ. I'm not striving in scarcity, but living in God's abundance. And truthfully, the more we follow Christ, the more sanctification we experience and the easier this humility becomes. And don't let that 50-cent word, sanctification, scare you. As author Whitney Capps has said in her book, sanctification is the progressive work of becoming more like Christ. It addresses the internal quality of our spiritual maturity and is evidenced by external actions. 
This is what Paul was instructing believers to practice. And he set them up for, with a great example. Look at how Jesus lived his earthly life. Think of yourself in the way Christ Jesus thought of himself. You see, Jesus had every right to cling to the advantages of his status, as the message translation phrases it. Why? Because Jesus was God, but he humbled himself. He took on human flesh. He wasn't worried about being equal with God, and instead he spent time with God. He honored him, and in his obedience, Christ sets his example for us. And that's what Paul is telling his friends to emulate. Your attitude, he said, should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. Other translations say that we are to take on the mind of Christ. Good news, 1 Corinthians tells us that that's possible. Chapter 2, verses 15 and 16 say, The spiritual person, however, can evaluate everything, yet he himself cannot be evaluated by anyone. For who has known the Lord's mind that he may instruct him but we? have the mind of Christ. Now, since the idea of the mind of Christ feels a little bit of a stretch for me, um, I looked at the Greek word here, and I found it helpful. So the Greek word is phroneo, and it's a word that actually has a complex meaning. It doesn't translate to one single English word, but it's really a concept. And it kind of points back to sanctification. It says that the mind of Christ really speaks to the idea of one's inner perspective matching their outward behavior. I don't think there's a better way to sum up Christ's attitude, but that's still challenging for us to practice. Like us, Jesus took on flesh. Unlike us, he was deity, and he did not strip himself of that, fully God, but fully man in that moment in time. And what did he do with this attitude firmly in place? He became a humble servant, our humble servant. And if you'll indulge me, I'd like to read for you what commentator David Guzik says about Christ's humility, because it's just beautiful. He was humble in that he took the form of a man and not a more glorious creature like an angel. He was humble in that he was born into an obscure, oppressed place. Could have been born in a palace. He didn't choose to be. He was humble in that he was born as a child instead of appearing as a man. He was humble submitting in obedience to the appro- as appropriate to a child in a household. He was humble in learning and in practicing a trade and a, the humble trade of a builder. He was humble in the long wait until he launched out into his public ministry. My time has not yet come. He was humble in the companions and disciples he chose. He was humble in the audience he appealed to and the way he taught. He was humble in the temptations he allowed and endured. He was humble in the weakness, hunger, thirst, and tiredness he endured. He was humble in the total obedience to his heavenly Father. He was humble in his submission to the Holy Spirit, He was humble in choosing and submitting to death on a cross. He was humble in that agony of that death. He was humble in the shame, the mocking, the public humiliation of his death. He was humble in enduring spiritual agony of his sacrifice and separation from God on the cross. Does that humility sound weak or worm-like? Zero percent. This humility is rooted fully in Christ's confidence in and obedience to God. And this is that which we're called to also. Because of this humility, God exalted Christ. Obviously, we don't model Christ because of what we hope to get. He's not a vending machine savior. But we model Christ because he's what he, of what he's poured out for us, to us, and over us. Jesus Christ is indeed Lord of all. And Guzik points out an interesting observation in his commentary. He says, Paul wasn't cultivating this list of attributes because he thought the Philippians needed a nice theology lesson. He gave them this list as a practical tool they could pull out of their spiritual tool belt when they were facing hardships. And they were facing hardships. 
He gave it to them to illustrate his own hardship and how he was handling it. And he gave it to them that they might practice Christian unity in the midst of trials and struggle. And good news, it's useful for us because we all have trials and struggles and we live in a space where it's everywhere. At this point, Paul says something that looks a little controversial if we don't pay attention to nuance. Verse 12 says, Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. When we see the word salvation and work together, it can stir us up, right? Because Romans 11, 5, and 6 says, In the same way, then, there is also at present time a remnant chosen by grace. But if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. Galatians 5, 4 says, You have been severed from Christ. You who are seeking to be justified by law, you have fallen from grace. Perhaps one of my favorite passages, Ephesians 2, 8 to 10, says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So there's one word in this verse, verse 12, that makes a difference. Paul says, work out your salvation. He doesn't say work for your salvation. And so here's that picture of sanctification again. Christ died for our salvation once for all, but we have an invitation to participate in that process throughout our lives. And how do we do that? Paul says with fear and trembling. That's a lot to think about, but here's a simple analogy I I made. As I've shared in the past, I am a fan of reality TV. I will watch just about anything when I have a chance, which isn't often, to be fair. Survivor is my jam, but others in my family really enjoy Dancing with the Stars. Now, if you're not familiar with this, and maybe you are, um, the concept is simple. Take a celebrity of some sort who's never been on a dance floor, typically, or a TV singer, Olympic athlete, talk show host, football player, what have you. We've had, there have been all kinds. Pair them up with a dance pro and see what happens. What could go wrong? In most cases, the celebrity has zero clues. I think it's unfair when sometimes they have clues. But most of the time, they've really not done this before. And so they have to trust the dance pro to lead the way, to teach them. They have to commit to showing up and rehearsing. They have to rehearse a lot, often eight-hour days that they're doing this. They have to trust even their physical well-being, their health, um, injuries, things like that. They're putting a lot of trust in this one individual. And they start out stiff and unsteady. But over time, if they put in the work, they improve. They grow. They begin to express themselves differently. The pro, in turn, will start to think outside the box to find new ways to instruct or new skills to try as they begin to know one another. And ultimately, to begin, they begin to work in tandem. They move fluidly. They do it together. And so it is with us. We are not called to work for our salvation. God is asking us to let him in. He desires to move with us and show us his unforced rhythms of grace. No matter how hard we work on our own, our efforts always fall flat. But when we do our part, whatever that looks like to you, when we study, we repent, we draw near to him, whatever he's asking us to do, it's God who does the magic, so to speak. And we approach this process with fear and trembling. And fear is a tricky word in scripture, but we don't do this with a posture of of being afraid that God is gonna zap us for not getting it right, or because we're afraid we won't measure up, no. We, this fear is demonstrating the reverence, our reverence for God because he is God and he is good, trustworthy. This is not us cowering because we know our mess, but rather exhilaration from Almighty God that he sees us. Rather than write us off, he made a way where there was not a way 
Jesus Christ is now our bridge to the Father. So in these moments, I just ask you, I invite you to consider what working out your salvation might look like in your life right now. How can you, how can I continue to show up for the process of sanctification? What it looks like, what it looks like to me is to do something, to show up, to know, we know that Paul was talking about his brothers and sisters practicing their Christianity practically, living together in unity. There was work he was asking them to do. I think it's easy to think that because we know the saving grace of Christ, we're covered, we're good, we are in this new covenant, we're new covenant believers after all, but Charles Spurgeon says this, Some professors appear to have imbibed the notion that grace of God is a kind of opium with which men may drug themselves into slumber and their passion for strong doses of sleepy doctrine grows from that which it feeds on. God works in us, they say, therefore there's nothing for us to do. Bad reasoning, false conclusion. God works, says the text. Therefore we must work out because God works in us. I think of the Israelites. They had just um, come across the Red Sea. They had seen God move in a mighty way. And then they were in the desert for about 20 minutes and like, hey, this is terrible. Talk about complaining. And so they started grumbling and um, and, and the, the scripture says that they needed to be still. But we often forget to go on to the next verse which says, quit complaining and do the work. We pause with God, but then we do. I think the work we do, what we're being asked to do, is to keep showing up in our faith journey just the way a celebrity who doesn't know how to dance on the TV show has to put in the work or they will get eliminated or embarrass themselves. So maybe for you that looks like setting an alarm on your phone and making space to pray. It could even look like setting up an ambitious plan for scripture reading or a simple one. It might be getting out a journal and writing down what you feel God is teaching you. It could be serving in children's church, in the choir, or as a worship leader. For me in this season, where I need some quiet and some structure, it's been downloading an app with the daily office in it, which I'm guided through prayer three times a day. I don't always get three, but I get some because I need something to help me slow down and to make space to hear from God, to sit with him, to participate in the prayer the Holy Spirit is already praying over me and over you. There are infinite possibilities. Just keep going. Don't quit. And when we do this, when we show up and do the work, knowing it will be imperfect, This is the gift. This is the joy we will know. God delights in his children, and as we stand out in our love and devotion to him, we get to shine like stars, to be a light to those around us. Matthew 5, 16 says, in the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. God calls his people to look differently than the world to be unified under him, and that is a tall order, we know that, but it is not impossible. We are equipped equipped with the mind of Christ. We have been created to do good work, and there are good works created for us to do. To be unified under God, and that's when we will shine, like stars in Jesus' name. He's where we find our joy. Would you pray with me? Father God, I thank you for your word that encourages us, that convicts us, that gives us a plan and a path to Jesus, our bridge. Be near us, Father God, and I pray that you would inspire us as we seek to settle down, settle our hearts, and make space for you. I pray that we would come with an attitude of expectation, trusting that you will show up And Father God, that we would have eyes to see exactly what you're doing and to participate in that process. Be near us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you stand and sing as you are able our final hymn?
leave, I just want to read a passage from Hebrews over you. Now may the God of peace, who brought up from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, with the blood of the everlasting covenant, equip you with all that is good to do his will, working in us what is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ. Glory belongs to him forever and ever. Amen. Peace be with you. On behalf of Hempfield Church of the Brethren, we thank you for joining us for today's service. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.